It is time to go deeper in God's Word. It's time to engage in truth. Here is Dr. Steve Ford and Pastor John Bornsheen. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. This is Steve Ford, your co-host for today's show, along with Pastor John Bornsheen, Senior Pastor at Calvary Fellowship, Fountain Valley here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Well, we just finished celebrating what many consider to be the most amazing event in all of history, the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John 1.14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer said, The incarnation itself is an unfathomable mystery but it makes sense of everything else in the New Testament. Wow, what a statement. Speaking of the Incarnation, around 1400 years earlier, God established the Jewish feasts as recorded in the book of Leviticus. Today, Pastor John is going to lead us through a discussion of those feasts and how they foreshadowed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pastor John. Oh, Dr. Ford, it's so good to be back with you. I know over the last few weeks, uh, I'd done a little bit of solo op there where we were talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, giving the cast of Christmas, and uh, just talking about all the details that really surround even some of the the traditions. But uh, more importantly, as we put our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and talk about this amazing, miraculous birth. And even on Sunday, had the privilege on uh, Christmas Eve to be able to share about how all of this I mean, think about everything from his miraculous birth to fulfilling 355 prophecies to raising the dead, 37 recorded miracles, all the I am statements that he is God in flesh. He is God. Do we believe it? And you put all of this together and ultimately it comes down to you making a decision. Do you believe it? And and That's that's really what we have even here today on this program as we talk about the plan of God. And and so we're going to be talking about the feasts, but really it's all about the plan of God that from the very beginning, it was always the plan. God had already seen the end from the beginnings. He tells us in Isaiah 46, 10. So I think that's really what we're observing here today and and recognizing as we go into this new year, 2024. I can't believe it. 2024. (laughs) I still remember Y2K. I know I probably just just talking about that. (laughs) A little bit about that. (laughs) Yawn 2K. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) right. I know. It's amazing. But, you know, as we we think about those things and even going back to, you know, what happened September 11, 2001 and and all of these uh, very historical moments and pivotal moments that have forever shaped our country and the way we engage with one another, how we travel, all these things have happened. And right now, even as we continue to pray for the nation of Israel and what's happening in Ukraine and all around the world, I shared with our church that there's over 110 different conflicts going on right now around the world, while only two are predominantly getting the headlines. Uh, There's over 110 from Asia and even there's seven that are happening around Europe. Uh, those that are happening around Africa and even in uh, Central Latin America and uh, South America and so forth. So we're, you know, we're surrounded by conflict. We're surrounded by these wars. And so we have to constantly be a people of prayer, ever grateful for what God has given to us, even here in these United States. We don't know what 2024 will bring, right. but what we can be assured of is we go to God's word. We know the plan of God. And so as we talk about the feasts of Israel, it's not just to talk about something that was given to Israel, but really so we can bask in his goodness to say God has had a plan from the very beginning that he is seeing this thing all the way through. And this strengthens our faith. I, I think the Greek word there is sterizo. Mm-hmm. He strengthens <laughs> our faith. And that's what we need is to know that God is not reactive at all. Right. That though the world is given to uh, these the constant ebbs and flows and calamitous events and chaos that ensues and the darkness that grows darker. And we get discouraged by that. And we go into 2024 going maybe a little bit fearful, a little anxious of the unknown it's unknown unfamiliar territory some of us thought we would be in flying cars by now right everything is different and so when we go into this with ai and all these things uh, we can be stressed yeah and we dare not be stressed as people of faith we go back to philippians chapter 4 where our anxiety is placated where it is put aside that when it is properly dealt with with the fullness of our understanding of our faith and the peace that surpasses understanding in god's holy word 
We become a people that are grounded in truth, not tossed by the stormy waves. And therefore, we look to the lighthouse of truth. And that's what I believe that we're to do here on Engage in Truth. So I'm excited by yeah. this study. No, amen. We need to be in the word. And I think, as you so aptly described, it's just going to get weirder you know, <laughs> as we move forward. And, right. uh, and things are just going to get stranger. And there's going to be more lies. And there's going to be more deception. And, and even in the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus would say even that the very elect might be deceived. Um, so we really have to know our scripture. The only thing, the only truth that we have in this life is scripture. It's the thing that we can count on. It's the lens through which we examine the rest of life to see truth and falsehood, a falsehood, I should say. And as you mentioned from an anxiety standpoint, and we've covered so many times, and I'm, I'm just so glad we have because the sovereignty of God is so evident in the Old Testament, please read the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and it will bring peace to your mind that God has a plan. God is large and in charge. Read the book of Daniel. He raises men up. He brings them down. Everything is according to his will, his purpose, his plan. He's in control, and everything is going to be okay. That's right. And, and by being okay, meaning the kingdom of our Lord is coming. That's right. And, and, and we, we know that he's going times. to come for his church. Right. Uh, there is a harpod, so I believe on the very near future, in the near future, on the horizon. And we are excited by that. Now, whether it means I graduate from this flesh right. beforehand, either way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. With the Lord. We are victorious. We are That's more right. than conquerors in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're assured of this in Romans chapter 8. So by knowing the word, we're not tossed about. Even then in an election year, when we say the presidential elections, which affect the whole world. Right. We know it does. And it stresses people out. And we know, although, boy, the, here we go. Now it means that every other commercial is going to be, this person's terrible, vote for me. Um, you know, and, and all of those things that just exhaust us. And the reality is, is regardless of whoever occupies the, the seat of president of the United States has been appointed by God, even if we totally disagree with decisions that they make or the outcome of those elections, or even if we feel like the elections are not authentic, whatever our feelings are toward that, we know that God is... As you indicated already, as we've studied from Daniel thoroughly, that he is over all the kingdoms of the men, and he is going to bring all of this to his glorious outcome, which is assured. There are a thousand prophecies or more about his second coming, yeah. and he's going to see to every single detail, and Jesus Christ will reign on high. Right. Amen. <laughs> yeah, just as you know, all those prophecies were fulfilled in the birth of Jesus, all these prophecies will be fulfilled in his return. And these, I, I just continue to sit in amazement with the Apostle Paul when he talks about all of the things that he went through and he describes them as light and momentary troubles, all the beatings mm-hmm. and the shipwrecks and everything else. But in the end result, all of those things, all those things that we experience in life will only draw us closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We experience those things when we experience more hardship, when we experience more difficulties, we experience more Jesus. And that is one of the great things about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I will never leave you or forsake you, he's told us. He is there in the deep, dark times. He's there in the good times. And he will see us through until each one of us who have accepted him as our Lord and Savior will spend eternity with him. That's right. Amen. Well, Dr. Ford, I think we've got a wonderful program this week and next coming up here as we're talking about the plan of God. I think that's really what it's all about. It's the plan of God. And and how that was recognized was the fact that the Lord had commanded his people to observe various days. We just came out of Christmas, which was a tradition. Uh, You know, we're not even instructed biblically to to keep the birth of Christ. And we also know, as we've told you before on this program, not to be the, you know, the negative one, to throw a little (laughs) water on your fire or something like that. No, no. We know that Christ was probably born around September, October uh, in, in alignment with these feasts. And so when we talk about the feasts of Israel, what we're talking about is the plan of God that's unveiled It impacts everyone, not just the Jews or all 12 tribes of Israel, but Gentile alike. And it always pointed to the plan of God in every one of those details. Even the weekly Sabbath pointed to the plan of God. I believe that was a foreshadowing of the reign of Jesus Christ, that he is the the ruler over the Sabbath and, and the entirety of the millennial reign of Christ will be a 1,000-year Sabbath after 6,000 years of human history, culminating, finishing with a 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth before the new heavens and the new earth come. So all of it was a foreshadowing. So the weekly activities that would build up even into a account of years, 
And we see that with the Shemitah cycles, there would be a count of seven years. So you've got seven days and then ultimately seven years. And then you would count those to a Jubilee cycle. So there was a count of years of years. So everything was on a micro level that was a reflection of a macro level plan. And that's what God assures us of. As he saw the end from the beginning, there's always been a plan. Ever since he created Adam, he had already seen the cross. Right. It's never reactive. And as we understand that, then we see the sovereignty of God over everything and our very breath he knows us by name. He knows the number of the hairs upon our head. He knows whether a sparrow rises or falls. Right. He knows everything, right? So God is in every detail, and we don't believe the lie of Satan that somehow God has checked out, that he created and walked away, that he was the first mover and not involved in the details. He's involved in everything. And, and so when we understand that, we realize he's never late. Everything is purpose. Yep. There is a perfect timing that everything is moving towards a designated date, and we know that date is fast approaching. And I believe we are in the final Jubilee count before the coming of the king. And how exciting that is. We're seeing prophecy unveiled even real time right before us. So if you don't mind, Dr. Ford, I'll jump right into this. And I know you've got a lot of questions because really this whole program is your fault. You, you, you wanted to <laughs> know so more many about other the things. feast. <laughs> so Dr. Ford pulled me aside after one of the programs and he was like, you know, I want to, I think our listener needs to know more about the feasts of Israel because we're saturated in a culture of traditions and we have our own Western traditions of things, even December 25th being Christmas, even though biblically it's probably more like September, October. And so where did these traditions come from? Well, we've talked about that, but let's go back to the biblical guidance on the, the specific days and why those days were appointed and what they mean right. and, and how they're even applicable to us Gentiles. Um, not that we're going to in any way tell you you've got to start observing Passover and unleavened bread and Feast of Weeks and all these sort of things. No, no, no. But rather that they were a foreshadow of, of something in Christ. It always pointed to Jesus Christ. Even before the law was given, the plan of God was revealed. I mean, look at uh, John chapter 5, for instance. And I'll give you the old King James here. <laughs> John chapter 5, verses 46 to 47. Jesus says, For had ye believed Moses... Ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Again, it's, it's not that suddenly Jesus Christ came on the scene at Christmas, but rather he was involved in every detail from the very beginning. He was the one doing the creating. We see that in the Apostle John's record, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's not that Jesus was created. Jesus was doing the creating. And he was fulfilling the plan of God, even incarnate coming through the womb of Mary. And so Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 18 tells us that Jesus did not come to destroy, but to fulfill the law, the very law that he had given, the only law that was ever given to man, 613 ordinances, and only he could fulfill it. No man kept all 613. And James tells us, you break one, you've broken them all. all right. Now you have fallen short of the glory of God, because only the Lord Jesus could fulfill all 613 and therefore be defined as perfect. I mean, after all, if you're going to define perfection, you've got to give an outline. And he did that. And he fulfilled it perfectly, made no sin, no, committed no error to keeping every letter of the law. And you see the proto-evangelium, go back to Genesis chapter 3, I like that word. Uh, you see the very plan where Christ, there would have to be a savior because sin had entered the world. And it was already the plan that Jesus Christ would come and he would crush the head of Satan, but his, mm -hmm. his heel would be bruised, i.e. the cross. And he would carry forth those wounds, I believe, even in his glorified body, as we see in Revelation chapter 5, even as he reveals to Thomas those scars were the indicators of total victory, victory over death, victory over sin. Uh, the greatest conqueror who ever lived because he conquered the thing that no one else right. could have ever conquered. No man, no angel, not even Satan himself, right? I mean, even as grandiose as he thought himself to be, none would ever be able to conquer what Jesus conquered. Sin and death forever. Yeah. And so those are not marks of shame, but marks of a conqueror of total right. victory as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it was always the plan of God fulfilled, revealed throughout his word and revealed through the holy feasts. He tells us in Romans 15, four, for whatsoever things were written a four time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So I, what we see is that everything written of the past was for our learning today. 
And so the Old Testament is not done away with. The Old Testament is very much a part of the full plan of God revealed. All 66 books are there for a reason. Sometimes we spend a whole lot of time in the New Testament and we forget the Old Testament is the the foundation, right. the, the building blocks for the New Testament. It's a yeah. complete thought. It's a complete tapestry that our grand weaver is weaving. And so we miss uh, the, the beautiful ebbs and flows, the whole plan of showing everything revealed since Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, a whole plan revealed. And, and so, Dr. Ford, you're welcome to jump in. I, I get excited. I go through all this <laughs> and I think about all the types. I mean, the, the, there's a types, there's patterns that's what we're supposed to see through the whole Old Testament patterns. And all those patterns pointed to Jesus Christ, uh, the manna, for example, in the wilderness. And I don't have time to go through them all, but that illustrated the Christian walk, the daily provision of God. You were going to learn to be totally dependent on God. I and mean, think about that. He pulled the people out of Egypt. Egypt was likened to the image of the world. As we use Babylon often as the example for the image of the world for the entirety of the church that were to, to be set apart from Babylon and the harlot of Babylon that will be destroyed in the end. That whole system with it, the false worship, uh, idolatry and adultery and everything immoral that is captured in the essence of Babylon was captured in Egypt. So they are to be set apart from Egypt, learn total dependency on God, that through him and him alone will you learn your true provision, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word from the mouth of God. So manna represented this walking and dependency with God and of God. And then you have the brazen serpent, and we remember that from Numbers chapter 21, and that represented Christ being lifted up. And John chapter 3 tells us that in verses 14 to 16. That that image of, of what that he would take all the sin and shame upon himself for all of us. And, and so that image was to represent that, that uh, the sin, the shame of the serpent and the serpents that were crawling in their camp and they'd been bitten by because of their rebellion. They were given unto sin again and they looked up to this image. And likewise, it was to be a foreshadowing of Christ carrying all that sin and shame upon himself. And we have the rock that Moses struck. Kadesh, remember that in Numbers chapter 20, that represented Christ. And, and then we have in Numbers chapter 2, the whole camp layout of Israel, which I think is a fascinating study. If you've never, I mean, when you go through the early chapters of Numbers and you get all these counts, and we often avoid reading Numbers because of that, because we think it all it is is just a census. They totally forget there's amazing things that are captured in the book of Numbers. And one of that is you go through and you actually count how many people lived or were dwelling in those camps of each of the tribes of Israel. And the four corners around the tabernacle in which they were dwelling, you see the image of the cross. And where the tabernacle was would have almost been where the head of Christ was on that cross at the cross section of those beams. It always pointed to the cross. And then we have the symbols of the tribes of Israel themselves. Each one of the tribes had symbols, and each of those represented attributes of Christ as well. And then we see how in them being in the four corners around the tabernacle, there were the four faces of even we see of uh, the, the four living creatures around Christ's throne. We see of the cherubim themselves. There's so much imagery. Everything has a layer that you peel back another layer to. And that's the awesomeness of Scripture and the symbols in God's holy word. And so the feasts of Israel, we'll call them that, the feasts that were given to Israel were each symbolic. And they pointed ultimately to the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we're to see in that. That they weren't just feasts or observances or celebrations of (laughs) something of old. Right but rather is the full plan of God revealed. And so those who were observing them at that time wouldn't have necessarily understood the fullness of it until it was ultimately revealed in this mystery of the church age that was to come. And so we have the great joy of being able to read it all and going, wow, look at this. This was all the full plan of God revealed as there are seven stands on the candelabra of the menorah. There are seven feasts In the seven days, under the seven-year Shemitah, under the Jubilee (laughs) cycle of 49, everything, and by the way, the number seven appears over 700 times in the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) It it is the fingerprints of God on everything that he has created, even though the number eight was reserved for himself, which we'll see as we go through this study with the Feast of Tabernacles, even though there was a seven-day observance, there was this unique one-day observance tucked in at the end called the eighth day. It's often overlooked or forgotten. 
but yet it was a symbol of all things being made new of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So we'll get to that. I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, all of this, what we're to see, Dr. Ford, as we go through this study, and it might even take us more than a couple weeks to get through this because it's so awesome. We don't want to rush through it. But all of it was a shadow. It was a foreshadowing of something. Colossians 2, 16 to 17 says they were a shadow of greater realities. And, and so you could look at it and say Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, even Feast of Tabernacles. All of these were observances that reminded the people of what God did with them in the wilderness, delivering them from oppression, delivering them into a new land. Uh, you, you could say all of that is it was as you read about it in Leviticus chapter 23, you see that there all that imagery is there. However, once you add the new covenant into the mix and you look backwards, now you see the whole plan of God for the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And yes, even the salvation of the Gentiles is captured in there. What? I mean, it's amazing. Uh, all, all in these seven appointed Feasts that were carefully to be observed. Again, Leviticus chapter 23. Now, let me just throw this in there, Dr. Ford, for those who are excited to maybe jump ahead of us, because we know we've got some very eager learners out there. We've heard <laughs> from a few of them. Uh, the word feast in the Hebrew is moed, and it means to keep an appointment, a holy convocation. There's another word, the mikra, which is also means a rehearsal implying that this was a preparation for something of a future event, meaning there's more to this, but it wasn't yet revealed. So they were to go through these feasts, these observances for a reason, because it all pointed to the full plan of God that they did not yet fully understand, even though Moses wrote, even of Jesus. And we see these Christophanies throughout the Old Testament. Oh, we should sure. probably just do a show on that, of just how many yeah. Christophanies are throughout the Old Testament. But we see the handiwork of God, even Christ meeting with Abram. Uh, so he's been all throughout the Old Testament. So this was a rehearsal for something else. And that's often where we have the responsibility where God tells us to do our part, but we don't always fully understand the implications of right. our doing our part, mm -hmm. right? The cascading effect of our obedience. Right. I, I'm given exactly what I need to know. I walk in that obedience and God, who is the grand weaver, is taking all of those acts of obedience and he is weaving out this full tapestry that we may not fully even understand until we are with him someday. And then I suspect we're going to be learning forever and ever at that point, even more. Yeah, I think you make a great point in the sense that sometimes we can sort of want to grade ourselves like how we're how are we doing when really that's not really our role. Our role is to be obedient, uh, and it's up to to uh, to God to ensure uh, the consequences that all these things come together. I don't know that we can always know exactly sort of the impact that we're having, as you said, but really our role is to to love the Lord and be obedient, and then basically not worry about the rest of the stuff. I mean, that's those are those are the things that we're committed to. God's committed to whatever is going to happen with that, whatever the outcomes are going to be. That's right. So, I mean, I can't imagine that those who were observing the Feast of Weeks at that time would have known that today we would call it Pentecost. Right. And it was about the birth of the church. Right. How right. would they have possibly known? It was a yeah. mystery that was still concealed and then revealed later. And the Apostle Paul, I believe, addresses that in Ephesians about this mystery that was unveiled, uh, where the those whose eyes were veiled to these truths were now suddenly open to the reality of God's full plan. So how would they have known by yeah. keeping the Feast of Weeks that they were honoring what God was about to do in the salvation of Gentiles? Yeah. They wouldn't have known, but they had to be obedient. Right. And so we're going to have, I know we're out of time today. It's amazing. <laughs> it goes by too quick. So we want to encourage you as you're listening to this program, as you join with us next week, uh, I hope you're going to be just as excited as we are, as we talk about the plan of God unveiled through the feasts that were given to the nation of Israel. And, and what we'll look at then is how all seven of them point to the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll look at what is still observed during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, because something very unique there we've talked about on the program before, but you'll need to pull all these pieces together to see that there is still something to come even beyond the church age after the revelation, the judgments therein, and then the millennial kingdom, and then into the new heaven and new earth. So we've got a lot to talk about. We want to thank you for listening to engage in truth. Dr. Ford, it's always so much fun That's to so have you to on the back. program. 
And we want to encourage you as you listen to these programs and you have questions or you're excited as we are and you want to share some thoughts, even words of encouragement, you can reach out to us at calvaryfountain.com. This is a program of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church and services are on Sundays at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. And we'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends, and thanks for listening. Take care.